So I'm Robert Berg from the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures and Cinema Media Studies at the University of Chicago. It's a great pleasure to welcome today Keith Gesson, uh, author of A Terrible Country, a new novel. Uh, Keith has a BA from Harvard and an MFA from Syracuse University. He is known as a translator from the Russian, most notably Svetlana Alexievich's Voices from Chernobyl, Lyudmila Petrushevska's There Once Lived a Woman Who Tried to Kill Her Neighbor's Baby, Scary Fairy Tales, and of the poetry of Kirill Medvedev, whom I mentioned because he has of late been a frequent guest in these parts. Uh, in 2004, Keith became a founding editor of the uh, N Plus One magazine, which Keith once described and told as like partisan review, except not dead. And that is still not true, uh, I think. Oh, that is still true, I should say. Still not dead. It is still not dead. Mm -hmm. um, in part through N plus one, I believe Keith became a quite visible activist, um, for instance, in the Occupy movement in 2011. And he has written extensively about those experiences, both of uh, being a, f a founding N plus one and of participating in the Occupy movement. Um, Keith Gesson published his first novel, All the Sad Young Literary Men, in 2008, and is here at the Seminary Co-op Bookstore to discuss his second novel, A Terrible Country. Welcome to Thank Chicago, you. Oh, Keith. Thank you. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Um, the novel traces its protagonist during a year he lives in Moscow, where he was born, but never has been since the age, since an early age. Um, its narrative ambitions are quite modest in, in some respects. Uh, it finds humor and significance in small details of the first-person narrator's experiences in Russia. But through these details, he grapples with large-scale issues, uh, not only of contemporary Russia, but also concerning history, relationships, and politics. Um, I was thinking it might make sense to ask you to read a small passage mm -hmm. um, based on that. I, I have a couple of options. Mm. Um, 177 here um, to 178 or 159 to 60. So that's, I don't, you probably don't remember that by page, but this is Sergei's story on mm -hmm. 159. And then okay. 170 is where you're reflecting on the cafe. Um, 176? 177, I'm sorry. 177. Um, like down there. I found myself gradually. I feel like that's that's a bit more one. more uh, my okay. speed. Okay, and uh, how far? Just uh, okay, great. To, to the point at which you feel <laughs> it's good to stop. I found myself gradually but unmistakably looking at the world a little differently. I had once thought it so strange that across the street from the KGB was a cute cafe with Wi-Fi, but it wasn't strange. It wasn't any more strange than the fact that my university back home, a place where people were supposed to live silent and monk-like lives in the pursuit of knowledge, had a beautiful multi-million dollar gym. Or that in my old Brooklyn neighborhood, the violent displacement of people from the homes in which they'd lived for decades in the stoops on which they were, on which they were used to sitting <clears throat> Sorry. Or that in my old Brooklyn neighborhood, the violent displacement of people from the homes in which they'd lived for decades in the stoops on which they were used to sitting took place to the accompaniment of cute cafes. Cute cafes were not the problem, but they were also not, as I'd once apparently thought, the opposite of the problem. Money was the problem. It had always been the problem. Private property, possessions, the fact that some people had to suffer so that others could live lives of leisure, that was the problem. And that there were intellectual arguments ardent, ardently justifying this, that was a bigger problem still. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of those examples of something very small, this detail of the cafe that you're in, that you're working in, and the way in which it opens up onto these large-scale issues, which mm -hmm. I, um, I, I found your view on them so, so uh, uh, revelatory at times. And based on that packet passage, I, I thought I'd ask you to start off with, to what extent you found, as you were writing the, bot uh, the book, the Russian situation sui generis, um, or to what extent you find it part of a, a global process and, and how you navigated that dilemma as you were writing the narrative? 
Hmm. Um, I mean, you know, so the kind of background to the book is that I started going back uh, to, I was born like the narrator in, in uh, Moscow, and I started going back when I was in college, so in the mid-90s. And, um, you know, I had, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, in the middle of my uh, college years, and um, I had been studying Russia, but I hadn't really experienced it as, a, as an adult, and um, I certainly hadn't experienced it in the post-Soviet period. So the first time I went back was 95. I don't know when you started going to Russia. My first trip was 1989. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. So I'm, I'm celebrating 20 years. All right. Year. And, um, uh, sorry, uh, 30 years. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and then did you, did you keep going back in the 90s? Yeah, I've been back, uh, you know, most years since then. Okay. Yeah. Probably. Well, so I, so I hadn't seen it, you know, so I guess we were, you know, I, we left in 81 and then we went back in, I think, 88 or 89 for a, a, a visit, um, 88, and then, um, and then 95, right? So, um, you know, the, the whole city was flooded with kiosks and, um, you know, people just selling stuff on the streets, um, currency exchanges. I don't know that I'd ever seen a currency exchange, right? Um, but the ruble was unstable, so basically anytime anyone had uh, earned any money in rubles, they would change it to dollars, and then if they w wanted to buy something, they had to change it back to rubles, right? So the currency exchange was like the best business you know, in Moscow that, that people could be in um, if they didn't have a ton of capital, I guess. Um, and so, so that, and I didn't know what to, you know, and, and I had come over, you know, I was a pretty standard kind of, you know, liberal college student, whatever, and I thought, um, you know, and I, I hadn't thought very deeply about it, but I kind of thought, well, the Russians need to get with the program, and, and, and once they build capitalism, it'll be, you know, nice, like it is in America. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, I saw quite clearly that that wasn't happening. <laughs> um, and, you know, that people had been uh, sort of dis displaced from their jobs, from their kind of mm -hmm. I, uh, sense of the world, right? But, um, I didn't really have a, a language for it, um, but I did start kind of, you know, when I came back from that year uh, in Moscow, I started reading um, kind of more leftist stuff and, and started thinking, oh, the kind of critique of capitalism that uh, in uh, that had seemed abstract when it was applied to uh, American capitalism as I knew it in the 90s it was, seemed fairly benign. Mm -hmm. um, made a lot of sense when applied to the Russian case, right? Um, and s so uh, it didn't really, you know, so it took me, but it took me years before, and it was actually um, reading Kirill Medvedev's work, uh, which I discovered on a trip to Moscow in 2006, um, when, when uh, N. Law published uh, his uh, texts, published without the permission of the author. Um, uh, and and that was when you know, and he was basically just writing about Russian capitalism in the way that I had seen American leftists write about American capitalism, and it just made and he and in fact he was reading a lot of Western Marxism, right? He wasn't coming kind of out of a Leninist mm -hmm. uh, tradition. I mean, he was I think he was reading Marcuse, he was reading, you know, uh, the Frankfurt School, reading Marx, right? So he was, he was reading a lot of. Um, Western Marxism and kind of importing it in, into um, Russia to try to explain the situation. Um, and of course, and you know, his the reason his texts were published without his permission is that he had um, rejected copyright to his works, right? So he began in a, you know, so the kind of critique of Western Marxism is that it had become too cultural, right? But for Kirill, actually, that was, you know, being able to connect uh, what he did as a poet, right, as a kind of cultural worker with the broader stream of Marxism was very valuable, right? And he began by, you know, he began his activism um, as a poet, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in, in the kind of poetic field. Mm -hmm. um, like a long answer to your question, but but uh, yeah, and, and it was you know it was reading his work and then kind of understanding that actually the U.S. case and the Russian case were pretty, you know, obviously the U.S. more advanced, but they had a lot to say to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fascinating because. Uh, the 
it's fascinating to hear that the 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 idea, as it were, of um, viewing the Russian case as a as a local instance of the global development of capitalism um, far precedes the novel because it uh, you portray the narrator as really coming to this realization at a at a somewhat later moment in the development of capitalism in Russia uh, after the rise of the the, digi the digital world, the um, the Wi-Fiization of of Russia, etc. Right. So there's a very specific context within which your narrator um, is is coming to that consciousness, and it, it really seems seamless uh, in the story that he is encountering, mm -hmm. um, which raises, I guess, the question: When you were writing that story, as you were writing that story, did you come to view the situation differently? Did this did the story, or was the story really uh, produced? Out of this concept of of uh, Russia and its uh, integration into world capitalism, um, I mean, cer I mean, certainly, you know, so I've been I've been writing about Russia for many years, um, mostly as a journalist, also as a translate, you know, working as a translator, but mostly as a journalist, and um, I've been trying to, you know, I have been trying to say this for a while <laughs> as a journalist, and um, I have not found. That I have succeeded, you know, right. and, um, and partly just because of maybe I'm not a good enough journalist, or there's kind of the nature of the uh, of the, the way I, you know, I think if I were a more polemical kind of journalist, I, I might have made more headway. Um, but I did feel like I'd failed to kind of deliver this message, and and I, so I did want to do the novel as mm -hmm. a way of kind of making this argument. I mean, the thing that changed, so that argument was always uh, part of the book. Um, Kind of part of the challenge was having the narrator um, go through this journey in six months that it had taken <laughs> me more like ten years, right? Yeah. Um, although I, you know, I did have that initial kind of encounter with what Russian capitalism actually looked like, which was, you know, I, I remember right. that very clearly. Um, the kiosk, the kiosk of the nineties, the, the kiosk yes. plays an important role in the novel in in, in key moments. Yes, yes, and well, that is now more. Uh, well, a less prominent feature Indeed, on, on yes. the landscape. Yes, yes, and um, you know, I'm, do, you, I, do you remember when that happened uh, a couple of years ago? Yeah, and uh, people, you know, the, the reading, but reading about it in the Western or kind of in the and the kind of liberal Russian press, they, you know, no, it was like. It was, you know, like the night of the non long knives <laughs> for the kiosks. <laughs> like, like they were like they finally like Sovietized yeah. Moscow, and then I so I hadn't, um, hadn't I was sort of hadn't been for a couple of years again, and I was there a year ago at, after post kiosks. It looks great. I mean, you can see where you're going. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm torn on it. I, yeah. I, I read someone say the other day that that's the single most important thing that's happened in post-Soviet Russia or something, getting rid of the kiosks. But I was someone who depended on them for various things, including oh, for Wi-Fi, in fact. The cafe that I worked at uh, it, for, for a relatively long stretch of time in the late 2000s was one of these temporary buildings in front of Arbatska oh, metro station. Oh, yeah, those were horrible. By where I was staying. Yeah. Uh, it was an okay cafe, and it was open really late, and it had good Wi-Fi. And then, uh, yeah, but and then one was, fine day, yeah, it's, it's gone. gone, it's gone. <laughs> but it was unsightly, um, you know. Yeah, it yeah. Uh, literally prevented you from seeing the building that was <laughs> yes. that Arbatska is in. But to pursue this question a bit more, so um, you're someone who pursues a pretty broad range of uh, literary activities. Uh, you have a broad range of literary commitments. So where, how do you? F find, how, how do you place fiction among that broad uh, array? Um, I mean, yeah, and specifically I, with your political commitments? So. Oh, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think of myself as a fiction writer who has been distracted by mm. many um, things, <laughs> uh, you know, certainly N plus one and, um, and translation and, and, you know, uh, probably N plus one and journalism have taken up the most time. Um, and uh, you know, and I understand why I've been distracted by those things. They're they're sort of more immediate, and and uh, they're fun, <laughs> and and you know that they're going to get published, um, or you know that's the assumption. With fiction, you just never know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, so I, I I think of myself as a fiction writer who has who has uh, strayed. But but um, with the with the political stuff, I mean, I you know I. Um, 
what I was saying just, just a minute ago was I, I felt like I, I couldn't, I hadn't done it as a journalist. Could I put it in a novel, right? And I feel like, I mean, I don't, this has not, um, clearly has not uh, overturned most Americans. Yet. <laughs> Yet. Yes, it's, you know, it's a slow burn. <laughs> well, it's, it hasn't, there hasn't been that much time as far as fiction. Yes, yes. So. Well, and, the, you know, and the book is selling, you know, s s you know bit by bit, bit by yeah. bit, we, we do this work. But um, I feel like, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's kind of a nice way to deliver um, a political message, the novel, mm -hmm. actually. And, you know, and, and if I think of my own, um, maybe not my politics, but certainly kind of one's um, humanism, right? I mean, it's certainly the novel has, in my own kind of life, reading life, has played um, by far the, the greatest role, right? So, you know, Tolstoy, you know, um, I think is the person I learned the most about um, trying to be a good person. Okay. Um, How about being a good writer? Uh, I mean, I, I wish. <laughs> yeah. Well, who, who uh, this was a question that my colleague, who I hope will make it this evening, but he sent me just in case his question, um, which is what writers contemporary in Russia and the US, or English language and Russian language writers, he says, you um, take the deepest interest in? Mm. Oh. Um, Oh, so many. Um, I, I, you know, uh, Petrushevska, um, as a as a fiction writer, whose whose work has a you know amazing continuity from the kind of Soviet to the post-Soviet um, period, because she was writing about the domestic sphere, right, which has which was violent and and uh, unequal and has remained that, right. Yeah. So uh, she didn't have to really change very much. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, um, Kirill, Kirill's work um, okay. really um, kind of changed my idea of what a writer could do and, and what a writer should do. Um, you know, while I was writing this book, um, uh, I read um, one of Davlatov's short books. I thought that was pretty, uh, Pushkin mm -hmm. Hills, it's tra actually translated by his daughter. Um, that's a good book. Yes, yeah. it is a very good book. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I read. Every, I kind of read everything, uh -huh. um, and, 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 in, and people writing in English. Oh, um, what have I read? I'm a big fan of Elif Batuman. Uh -huh. um, it seems mutual. Oh um, yes, but I was you know I was a fan first, yeah. hers okay. before she was a fan of mine. Um, uh, who else? You know, I think Franzen's a great novelist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, Nell Zink. Yeah, her novels I've really enjoyed recently. Um, okay. Well, picking yeah. up on mm -hmm. the Elif Batuman uh, mention there, the, the protagonist of your novel, Andrei Kaplan, is a uh, recent PhD in Russian literature. Yes. And one strand of the narrative concerns his ambivalence about his profession. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's odd to me how frequently, maybe it's just my particular vantage point, but how fr frequently novels written in English seem to take aim at the study of Russian literature. <laughs> really? Um, oh. Uh -huh. And at those people who perform the study of li Russian literature. Um, so <laughs> Elif Batuman's novel uh, is, is one recent example. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And David Lodge has a, a novel, and, and I can't remember the title of it actually, but, but the protagonist is trying to write this book about uh, hmm. Lermontov okay. during it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for me, as a professor at the Department of Slavic Languages uh -huh. and Literatures here, I wonder about these pot shots uh, <laughs> that your character takes at hmm. my profession. What is it about us that bothers you? Oh, no, uh, nothing. No, no, I, I love, are you kidding? My, it's well, my Alex home. Alex Fishman. Yes, Fishman. Is, well, is the, you, uh, do you, you don't w wish to claim <laughs> a <laughs> no, Fishman. But, uh, <laughs> but he is the, uh, the bait noir of, of the novel. Yes, yes, the, yes, the, yes, the, the guy who yes. succeeds mm -hmm. initially, but, uh, but right. maybe not in the long term That's in, right. in That's this right. field. <laughs> um, but, but it was a curious strand. Um, how did that, I, I just wonder how that came about in the novel. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, um, I began you know, it's 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 based on my own. You know, I did actually go and take care of my grandmother for a year, mm -hmm. like the narrator, um, at during that exact period of time. Um, you know, so 
uh, some of some of the stuff happened, some of it did not. But you know, um, and so initially I had kind of thought, well, can I, can he be kind of like me? Can he be like a translator or a journalist? Right, being a journalist would get him out of the house. But it, it kind of wasn't. It wasn't. I didn't enjoy writing that. And then I made him an academic. And then uh -huh. I really. And then I had started having a lot of fun. Okay. Um, so that's my question. Why yeah. is it so fun? Oh, you, so. I mean, I huh. That's interesting. I mean, so yeah. I mean, I love. Um, I love Slavic studies. No, no joke. I mean, I, you know, most of the books that I read, um, you know, certainly, you know, uh, historians of mm -hmm. the Soviet Union have meant a lot to me. Um, you know, both on the left, Sheila Fitzpatrick, University of Chicago, yes. um, and on the right, um, you know, Richard Pipes. Okay. Actually, a great historian, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, Russia, Russia under I'm glad the. Glad uh, Sheila isn't uh, here oh, to, to. well, uh, but yes, no. I mean, to push that. I don't. I don't think he behaved uh, very well <laughs> toward her, for example. But Russia under the old regime is a. Yeah. It's a good book. Um, and uh, anyway, yeah, no. So I love I love Slavic studies. I do. You know, um, I, to to be. I guess to be fair, I, I you know the, the Fishman character is a person who profits off the sort of uh, fascination with the kind of macabre uh, uh, aspects of, of, of Russian history, mm -hmm. right? And he's doing, um, he's digitizing the gulag, right? <laughs> um, I didn't actually have any academics in mind. I had some, it's more, that's more of a kind of a thing that uh, journalists and, you know, think tank people yeah. engage in, right? Um, you know, it, less so in academia, right? Mm -hmm. Academics, um, Tend to be a bit more circumspect, right. and, yeah. But you, uh, you do teach, if I'm, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, mm -hmm. at the Columbia School of Journalism. Yes, yes. Um, and do you have interests in extending into uh, literary academia? Oh, um, Can we hope for a book of uh, collected essays on on Russian writers, for example. Oh, uh, yeah, I would love to do that. You think that you think I should? You think people would care? <laughs> um, <laughs> Why well, you'd have to write them first? Okay, yeah. okay, okay. And then it's, yes, it's yes, possible. Yes. Um, <laughs> no. Well, you know, I, I, so I did my undergrad in in Russian history and literature. Oh, you did. Okay. Yep. Um, and um, so I studied with uh, Svetlana Boym and uh, Marshall Poe, mm -hmm. um, and I took classes with Pipes and Edward Keenan. Um, uh, so I mean, that was a very lively. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Russian group of Russian scholars. My mom uh, worked at the Russian Research Center okay. uh, back before the Davis Center with um, uh, Nekrich, who was the head of it th back nice. then. Um, um, Alexander Nekrich. Yeah. So, so um, I very much feel like um, the Slavic department is my home, <laughs> but uh, but I don't have a PhD, so I'm not qualified. I did. I tried to teach um, at the, the journalism school. is very um, practical. So it's kind of it's a professional school. It's one year, so you're just um, students get there. They need to learn how to report. They need to learn how to kind of package that reporting. Um, in the spring, they do kind of longer stuff. But so last year we actually did a, a class on Russian, um, on uh, you know reporting on Russia, but in the U.S. And so and that was fun. It was a bit more of an academic class than um, than. Uh, is typically taught at the J school. Um, so, yeah, there, I mean, and, and, and actually the, the reason I was able to do that is because Russia is so in the news. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, for better or for worse. Yes, yes, for better um, and worse. Yeah, for us, it's, 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 yeah, it's, I don't know, how do you feel about it? How do I feel about the, the fact that it's in the news? Yes. Um, well, it, it's, the, the news is a problem. You know, the, what they pick up, what the news picks up is, is possibly not what I would want to shine the light on, mm -hmm. I think. And, and I, um, I know that you m might agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are deeper processes occurring in various places that um, uh, tell us a lot about the longer term processes that are afoot, possibly than the things that end up in our news, which, and of course the fixation on Trump's meetings or not meetings with uh, Russian leaders, I think in the long run are gonna seem very inconsequential. Uh, well, th those things are gonna seem very inconsequential, but I, I do uh, have a growing sense of alarm about what is happening in Russia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and um, I um, yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that we find a way to talk about that and, and possibly your novel will indeed help us to find a way to talk about that in uh, America in the English language press and public culture uh, in a more intelligent and informed way so that would be that would be great from yeah. from your <laughs> lips to yeah but uh, well thank you very much oh. for joining us here thank you and uh, we'll be back soon with another installment <laughs> All right.